Okay, fighting through these trees looks cinematic. As well. Oh boy. And I'm throwing Where's something the in there to deal with it back up. That's a lot of brutes. Oh god. Roger. Oh, Thank you for the laser. Uh, there we go. Glorious airstrike coming in. Come on, game. I mean, we go. Yeah, that thing's pissed. It's one of those weird melee ones with a flamethrower. Everyone alive. I just landed. I just landed. I'm on my way. Get in, get in, get in. Oh, no, I was just dropped like that. Come, come, come. Get, get in here. Come, come, come. Get in, get in, get in. <laughs> That's right there. Oh, oh, that extraction. My health, my sliver. You have maintained. It threw me like. This is Helldivers 2, and it's become easily one of the best co op shooters that I've played in years. And that's because these kinds of experiences that you just saw are not rare, but kind of happen pretty much every single time you do a hell dive. And this is really surprising to me because I had looked at this game as maybe being yet another entry in an already long list of extraction shooters that we already have, but it feels like a breath of fresh air. And that's because I think it's a game that doesn't take itself too seriously. Now, activate the battlefield injury simulator. And seems pretty self-conscious about the references that it makes. I mean, the whole starting game tutorial experience that you have feels like it could be straight out of Starship Troopers from the movies in the late 90s. But anyway, the TLDW is that Helldivers 2 is an over-the-shoulder extraction shooter where you and up to three of your friends, or you just by yourself, or you even with some randoms, can team up to dive into a hell-like colonial planet that's been infested by either bugs or automatons. There you're expected to complete a various set of objectives at various levels of difficulty depending on which you've selected, all within a time limit and with limited resources, including stratagems, which are a type of resource that you use to call in airstrikes or support weapons or even respawns if you or one of your teammates die. The outcome of which can affect the whole galactic war that's going on that's happening in real time in concert with everybody else who's playing the game. So you'll see the map update, including real-time events that happen pushed by the devs that are tied to lore. For example, just last night the developers started a new push by the automaton side where they suddenly invaded additional colonial worlds and now there's a new set of defend missions that give you a bit of a bonus to defend them. So the game really gives you a sense that there's something bigger going on beyond just the single hell dives you go through, a worldwide campaign. How the game plays out though is that after you've completed the tutorial, you're given the helm of your very own nameable starship, which by the way, you, you can't just name it anything you want. It's a multiplayer game, so of course they're gonna control that a little bit more tightly. But before you get your hopes up too much, this isn't a game about piloting your own spaceship. So if you're following me for Star Citizen and you're looking forward to that, that's really not what this is about. Though the ship does move in real time, depending on where you've decided to go. So you can actually see the worlds and space moving around you as you go to and from the different locations to jump into, so that's a pretty cool attention to detail. I especially like that you can see other player ships as they dive in in real time when they're doing missions in that general vicinity. It makes it, again, feel like there's this bigger event, this bigger campaign happening around you. Returning to gameplay though, Helldiving starts with you going to the map table at the center of your bridge where you get a view of the galactic map where you get an overview of where humanity currently is in the fight. You'll see red for the automatons and yellow for the bugs. And depending on whether or not there's a special event going on, one or the other might be closer to reaching Super Earth at the center, so you're constantly struggling to push them back. Control of these planets is broken up into control of the sector as a whole, so if all of the planets in a given sector are liberated by Super Earth, then that becomes controlled by Super Earth's empire. Now choosing who you want to go after, the automatons or the bugs, really is up to you and what kind of mood you're in. They have a very different type of experience with the automatons 
Automatons really being challenging when it comes to a long distance fight and heavily armored targets, and the bugs being a bigger issue when it comes to the sheer volume of them overwhelming you. Though, that being said, there are armored bugs and they can get really aggressive and difficult to deal with. And depending on who you're going against, you'll also want to make sure you're bringing an appropriate weapon. Weapons like the DMR aren't great against bugs, but they can be excellent for picking out the heads of the armored targets you'll face on the automaton side. Beyond that, there's a huge variety of different planet types that you'll be able to visit from desert planets to forest planets to very rainy and boggy planets, which can be really difficult to deal with when you've got a lot of fog obscuring the enemies that are approaching you. And they can also be either hot, cold, or have electronic countermeasures if you're dealing with the automatons. That can be especially difficult to deal with, like if you called down a resupply stratagem and you suddenly get bombed instead. Sometimes the planet you're fighting on can be just as difficult to deal with as the mobs themselves. But after you've found the planet you like, then you look for the type of mission you want to do. And depending on which difficulty you've selected, difficulty ranges from level 1 to level 9, you'll have a variety of different missions that will go from individual mission sets to larger campaigns, which are more common in the more difficult level settings. These campaigns will yield greater and greater rewards if you complete the whole set of the campaign, which is why you might want to stick to that area after you've started a fight. Selecting a mission set will reveal the objective you'll have to complete in addition to just defending yourself from the countless mobs you'll encounter, alongside a time limit and any effects that the planet might currently have, which can be a buff or debuff depending on the situation. And these are the things that you really gotta pay attention to because even if you've selected, say, hard difficulty and you think you can manage it, those planetary effects and conditions can have a huge effect on how difficult the mission is. A medium mission can easily turn into an extreme mission if you've got terrible visibility and electronic countermeasures that make your stratagems basically useless. When you're ready to go with the one that you want, you can either jump in solo or invite some friends aboard your ship to dive in with you. You can also board your friend's ships if they're online and you see that they've got a slot available, or you can alternatively just do quick play where you can pair yourself with a group of people that you've not met yet. The cool thing about joining other people, including those on your friends list, is that if there's a mission already ongoing, you'll basically just drop straight into it with no friction, which can make it really easy to get back into the action if you're craving some more. After you've initiated the mission though, and you mount up on your pod, you're given one last chance to go over your equipment and to select the stratagems you want to employ in the mission. You get up to a maximum of four, and sometimes that can be limited to less if the conditions on the planet have a debuff. Again, these are one of those things that can really make the experience a lot more difficult than it appears to be on the surface. And while we're here on the subject of stratagems, the game offers you a bunch of different ones that you can use as you progress through the game. And these can offer abilities to drop bombardments onto enemies or to resupply yourself with more ammo, to deploy a defensive turret, a defensive shield, or even to drop in heavy weapons that are better than the ones you drop in with initially. Like a recoilless rifle, which is great for dealing with armored targets on the automaton side, like tanks and big heavies. But after you've selected where you want, you drop into an epic soundtrack. I really can't stress enough how much I love this soundtrack. It's incredible. And then you've got 10 to 40 minutes to complete the primary objectives that were given to you. However, there are going to be a lot of secondary objectives that you'll find along the way and you'll be incentivized to get them because this is how you really start to progress through the game. So instead of beelining to the objective, you'll probably want to take some time to explore within the time limit, balancing it obviously with how much ammo and stratagems you have left in order to be able to get what you need to bring back up to your ship. You'll want to find things like metals, which will allow you to unlock additional new sets of armor that have more buffs to help you on your way, to different types of samples, which will help you upgrade your ship, which is a permanent buff that maybe enhances how fast you get your call-ins or how devastating they can be to the enemy. But this is where playing with teammates really comes in handy. A lot of these caches that you'll find along the way, these secondary objectives, are really best done with another person, or in some cases can only be done with other people. There are some bunkers, for example, that have buttons on either side that require two people to open the door. And like the stratagems, a lot of these different locations and secondary objectives require you go through the process of pressing a series of buttons in a random order that can really make it even additionally more hectic. So having a teammate there to relieve some of the stress to cover your back can be a huge help. 
There are some though that you can solo, it's just that if you're playing by yourself, you won't be able to get all the loot. And by the way, loot is shared, so you never have to feel like you need to steal loot from somebody else. Which I think was a great move, given that in multiplayer games with loot, people tend to fight over the loot, so there's less reasons than to hate your teammates and kill them, because there is friendly fire in this game and there's no way to turn it off. At this point though, I think it's important to address the fact that the game does have a premium store with microtransactions, but thankfully it's not particularly egregious as far as premium shops go. And that's because there's not a terrible amount of current things on offer to purchase with real money. That being said, it is kind of annoying that they rotate the limited selection of armor every other day, so it gives you a sense of missing out, especially considering that the earn rate on premium currency is extremely slow and I suspect by design. But otherwise, there's no real benefit to spending money for progression. You just get some unique sets of armor and that's it, whose buffs really match what you can already get in the regular store. So really it comes down to aesthetics. Progression in this game then is pretty much only done through playing the game and not through spending real money, which is why I say it's not particularly egregious. Back to the missions though, that's why it's so enticing to spend some extra time looking around with your squad mates to try to find the resources that you need to do those upgrades and buy that next suit of armor to give you a buff that more suits your personal preference and playstyle. That's why I found the 40 minute missions tend to be the best ones for progression because it gives you a little bit more time to explore and take your time and complete all the side objectives to really maximize the profit you get in a mission. And that's the next thing. In order to get the most out of each mission and to get a complete and total victory, you really need to try to do everything you can on the map in the time that you have. Just going straight for the objective will only yield you just moderate returns. Risking it for the biscuit is really what you need to do to make any kind of fast progress then. And that's really what makes the formula of the game work so well. It's not just its sense of humor and the really cool setting and the amazing graphics, because this game looks and sounds amazing. It's the combination of everything together, like this insane rush to try to get everything done within the time limit with your limited amount of resources, really, really limited ammo. It makes you pick and choose which fights you really can get. You can't just keep shooting all day long because you're gonna run out and well, that's the end of the squad and the end of the mission if you do so. So it can create these hilarious hectic situations where you're like, all right, we're done. It's time to get to the extraction, which leads me to the last part of any hell dive and that's the act of actually extracting because that's not something that happens automatically. It's its own little mini event. After you go through the prescribed sequence of button presses, eventually you'll be able to call down a two minute timer for a pelican to pick you up. However, within those two minutes, it's gonna trigger a ton of extra mobs to come and try to pick you off to not let you leave the planet. And that's where things can get really, really crazy, especially on the harder difficulties. In the introduction, that was only level four and we barely made it out alive. So the game always makes you feel like you're making it out alive just in the nick of time, like, you know, the movies where the bomb stops at one second at the very, very last moment. And that's why I think Helldivers 2 is excellent. It's made from a studio that clearly seems to understand that gamers are just out there to try to have fun. You don't have to take yourself seriously. You don't have to have a super serious backstory. It can just be all tongue in cheek and players will eat it up if the gameplay experience and the way it's put together makes sense and feels really fun. And Helldivers 2 does that so well, it feels so replayable. Now, that being said, it is a extraction shooter and those do tend to get stale over the long term so i can't say for sure how this will feel over time but i do know that the developers have supported the original game over a long period of time adding in new factions new weapons even vehicles for players to use so it seems like they'll probably go this route given how popular this has become on steam in fact it has become one of the most popular games on steam at the moment which is really unexpected it just came out of left field for me i mean i was looking forward to this game this year but i had no idea this was going to catch on so much or that it was going to be so much fun which is why i think the 40 dollars price tag is actually well for me a bit of a bargain now everybody's on a different budget but i feel like i've more than gotten my money's worth so far but before you buy there's a huge issue you probably should be aware of concerning the pc version of this game Unfortunately, there's a lot of stability issues and I myself even started experiencing them towards the end of making this video, which is why I've not been able to collect all the footage I wanted to show you what I'm talking about like I typically do with these kinds of videos. Up until today, I've been able to launch the game fine, but now every time I try it, 
My computer freezes and crashes. I've tried reinstalling, I've tried checking the forums. There doesn't seem to be any solution right now. So I'm kind of stuck here, unable to play the game and collect any more footage. So just be aware that if you're buying it for PC, you might have these problems. So if you've got a PlayStation 5, you might want to go with that instead. But despite these growing pains for a newly released game, I'm still excited to get back into it when it's finally fixed. So if you've picked up the game, let me know how you're liking it so far. And if you've got a PC, let me know if you're experiencing the same problems as I am, especially if you have an AMD PC. I feel like this might actually be related to the X3D series. But that's it for now. I hope to see you guys in the next one and maybe I'll see you in a hell of a